Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Horror on the Orient Express as we are bound for Constantinople. So we'd like to thank you, the listener, and especially you, the Patreon supporter, who have supported this campaign and many other shows on the Old Ways Podcast over the years. We are continuing our adventures tonight with Call of Cthulhu. And in doing so, we will need to go through our introduction order. We will do so to my right. Hi there, this is Mike, and I play James Robert Fraser, who's had a lovely time in Sofia, but is rather looking forward to leaving as quickly as possible. Yes, yet again, another investigator uh, who is interested in leaving town very, very quickly. To Mr. Fraser's right. Hi, I'm Rena. I play Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy, and I got some magic. Yeah, you you did a little cloistering of yourself and did a, a little bit of, uh, you know, mystical incantation reading, and you've got some now some, some power, a little juice now to uh, perhaps turn the tide of things to come at the end of the table. Hi, this is Giles, and I'm playing Simon Griffith. And while I, Simon usually enjoys a hot meal, this is not what he was intended. That's correct. This is uh, far, far different than, say, a Midwest hot dish. This is the whole damn hotel on fire. To Mr. Griffiths, right? Hi, this is Miranda, and I play Maggie Bellinger, and I can always count on Paul to put a little pep in my step. Yes, your cocaine dealer of choice, Paul, is with you on this adventure and uh, happily getting on the train as parts of Sophia burned to the ground. And last but most certainly not least. I'm Martin, I'm playing Richard Courtney. And uh, Richard's just hoping we don't come across any more caves. I wouldn't think so, but then again, with the writers of this campaign, I wouldn't rule it out, sir. And so, we will raise the curtain tonight as the Orient Express makes its way out of Sophia, bound for Constantinople. Uh, the military does move a little slower than the engineers and the uh, train staff would like. They're really trying to keep the train on time. And so you do end up leaving Sophia, but likely about a quarter to the top of the hour rather than on time. This, as you can imagine, Mr. Fraser, irks the members of the Orient Express staff to no end. And they do let the passengers know that they are uh, those that see them letting them know that uh, the train will be making a slight adjustment to speed to make up the time. In engineering talk, that likely means hold on to a few things. Having come from a supper at the hotel, aren't necessarily hungry. You do smell a bit like uh, perhaps a, a little brimstone, maybe at least some burnt wood there, Mr. Fraser. You do have to take a, a little extra time for personal care and perhaps change your jacket because... Uh, it looks like you've spent a, an evening or so in the smoking lounge without having stepped foot there. I will uh, change for uh, drinks in the, the lounge bar on the train. But also, I'm going to sit down. We've got a good few hours and hopefully an uh, opportunity for a, a night's sleep before we arrive at our destination. Fraser's going to kind of spend a little bit of time ruminating on their travels so far the things they've encountered, the dangers they've faced, and the possibility that when they do reach Constantinople, there may be further, even more perilous times to come. And he's well aware, based on some of the circumstances of their journey, that there is a possibility, a, a distinct possibility, that he might not make it home again. So he's going to sit down and spend a little bit of time writing some letters to some people back home who he might have some last things to say to, some things that he maybe would want to ensure get said to them, even if it's in letter form, 
if this is the last opportunity he has for contact with them. So he, he'll, he'll spend some time writing and um, addressing and sealing these envelopes, along with some information for his uh, solicitor in terms of bequeathments of his small possessions and that sort of thing. Uh, just to set his affairs in order, just in case he does not return. Seems fairly reasonable. Anyone else taking uh, their time to do anything specific before bedtime? Lady Elizabeth has made her slow way to the professor's compartment. So I'm going to knock on his door. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah. Yes? It's Lady Elizabeth, Professor. Uh, I need a moment of your time. Uh, um, yes, yes, of course. Uh, Richard will open the door. I need you to witness the signing of a document for me. You're the most uh, socially acceptable person in our party to do so. Uh, right, yes, yes, indeed. Yes, yes. If you would like to um, lay it out on the table there, I'm, I'm happy to bear witness to it. So I lay out a document and you can just see written at the top of just his last will and testament and just sort of sit down very slowly and sign it and then turn it towards you to sign. So Richard will sign it, date it, put his name in position. There we are. I believe that's been properly witnessed. Thank you, Professor. If you need anything of the sort in return, I would be happy to. But uh, now that you know this exists, just in case... You can pass it on to Mr. Fraser if I'm not able to send it to my brother in time. Right. Yes. It's it's an interesting question. I am afraid I have, um, well, best. let's just say there wouldn't be any point in me uh, writing a will. But, uh, <laughs> oh, there we go. Well, should you think of it, I'll fold it up neatly. Just, if necessary, make sure it gets to the right person. Put it in my bag. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for the offer. You might want to consider it, Professor. I understand what you mean, but, um... I have learned lately that, that none of us are immortal. No. No, including our Miss Bellinger. I, I believe she thinks she is, or will be, or something. Yes, that was the other thing. We need to keep a close eye, I think, on Miss Bellinger. I don't trust her motivations. I think the Comte and perhaps the pieces are messing with her mind at the moment, and I would prefer in the future, until we have taken care of this, that you not mention any particular plans for destroying the simulacrum in front of her. It may not be wise. Ah, no, I mean, we don't have any at the minute, that's my concern, but, um, well, I, I, I certainly agree. We should, we should keep an eye on her. The, uh, the Comte is a terrible influence on her. I am, um, she's, she, she's fine, of course, but, um, it's, it's, it's this, this Comte with, uh, his, uh, silver tongue. Yes. And uh, we've come so far. Professor, can't fail now. No, no, quite. Or at least do our best not to. No, oh, well, it's just a shame she has to bear this um, simulacrum. I don't really understand why, why, I don't know, Mr. Fraser couldn't have taken it or, or Simon. Well, I don't believe Miss Bellinger was in much of a mind to allow it. Well, no, I mean, not uh, not ultimately. I, it looks like some sort of addiction. You have one of these things and, and then you have another and I can only imagine that there's some sort of effect they have on you that, uh, that means you want more. But, uh, well, it is what it is. Never mind. I just briefly reach out and just sort of touch his hand gently in a softly reassuring gesture before I pull away. I think I can potentially save her. Oh, I don't know. Something in the book? There's a lot th involved in it. But if I can, I will try. But she must not say this in front of her. She must not know. No, no, indeed. Indeed. What, 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 what must we do? Let you know if I figure out if it's workable. Right. I don't want to give you too much false hope. No, I, 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 I think whatever it is we do, we should be, um, I don't know, planning on doing it sooner rather than later. I, I'm, I'm afraid she might flay herself in the middle of the night and uh, do something unspeakable with this simulacrum. I mean, I, I don't... We, 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 we need to get on with it, whatever it is. We'll need a quiet place and a good bit of her blood. Oh. Which is why I didn't want to discuss it quite yet. Let me figure it out, Professor, and when we get to Constantinople we can 
Discuss it. You must keep a close eye on her, but Professor Discretion is the name of the game. No, no, I have I have an idea. I've read in some journals that uh, ancient, well, certainly older civilizations believed in relieving um, headaches by uh, drilling a hole in the brain and uh, or, or bloodletting or something. Yes, so I, I wonder if we could maybe say to, to Paul, look, look, we, we rather than um, uh, any more of your, your other treatments, perhaps perhaps we could try bloodletting. And I, I'm convinced that if uh, if Paul was to ask Maggie and, and, uh, and, and cite some medical evidence that uh, may be of suspicious origin, she, she might, might go for that. And perhaps we could extract it that way. That's not a bad idea, Professor. A little bit shocked, actually. Slight smile. We'll see what we can do. I can't guarantee anything. As I say, I am, I am concerned. We should, we should do something sooner rather than later. Doesn't bear thinking about. It. Well, I will leave you to your evening, Professor. Thank you for the service, and uh, do be thinking on what I discussed with you. I will do the same. Yes, yes. I'll leave the room. I've slipped my will into my bag next to another envelope that has the name Ilyana written on it, and then very carefully copied out in Cyrillic the same name. I've spent a long time learning how to do that. Very well. Um, so, Professor, how are you spending sort of the balance of the rest of the uh, time here? Are you exhausted and planning on sleeping? Are you going to maybe do your own research? Richard has this theory that... Um now he has the device and the extra lens, which kind of is turning the action mode on, as it were. And he's, it's only a loose theory. This this simulacrum must have a an inordinate number of threads coming from it. So perhaps if he was to try and find some sort of equivalent to thread scissors, he could, uh, he could don the device and then see if he could somehow, with the aid of the additional lens, interfere with the threads and uh, somehow disempower the simulacrum. It's an interesting theory. Interesting theory. Okay. Well, look in on Simon, but we'll get back to you, Professor. I'm certain there's something fun we could do with that. So, Simon, how are you spending the uh, the rest of your evening? Simon is uh, writing a letter to Ma. He knows he's going into the belly of the beast, and the last time he wrote her was during one of the big offensives during World War One. So he's preparing another one. He is also looking forward to the next place he's able to send a telegram because he needs to send something to the major. He still hasn't received a response yet, but he also needs to make sure that the embassy in Constantinople is ready for Simon to arrive. Very good. You're filling your evening there with a bit of letters. So the the evening turns along a little bit. Professor, if you'd like to go ahead and make me a power roll for uh, doing that investigation go right ahead. I will, of course, impose upon you a negative hand of fate and force you to reroll your tens die. Oh dear. The first one was a three or thirty. And this one was twenty. Very good. So you work through that um, rough patch, we'll call it, and you are able to don the device successfully. Investigating the simulacrum will need to be done afar at this point. Miss Bellinger is, as far as we know, inside her berth, where she is um, closely clutching her body parts or having personal time, whichever is the matter. We haven't had a, a chance to see what she's doing just yet, but I'm certain we will through the eyes of the device. So what lenses are you preparing to employ? So as it's from afar, we need the yellow lens and as we want to actually do something and take some action, we're going for the new lens. Hmm, the clear lens, okay. So um, seeing her from afar is not difficult with the aid of that lens. And with the clear lens, you're able to see all sorts of different patterns surrounding her. The easiest way to approximate what you are getting visually is imagine sort of a knitter's station, a loom perhaps even, had many, many threads going into it all at once to create some vast image on the other side. But what surrounds Miss Bellinger now is a stranglehold of many different colors, and each one have bound her at the wrist, at the ankle, around her neck, 
and they seem to be slowly asphyxiating those portions of her body. They're starving it out. And so her skin in those areas now is starting to take on a deep purple and almost black color. She looks as if she has been bound to this piece, this series of limbs, and not for the better. So as this is from afar, Richard is going to try and interfere with the threads. So if there's any chance he can pick something up, something metallic. Pick something up metallic that exists in her space or in your space? In her space, if he can do that. He's going to try very hard to do that. Okay. Make me a hard power roll. Mm-hmm. 22. That is a hard power roll. All right, very good. So let's see here. Uh, first, we'll charge you five points of MP for utilizing the device. That's very important. And then since you are attempting through the device to gap the space and actually touch something physically, that will cost you a D3 sanity. There is no roll for this. It is an automatic cost. And so that will cost you three points of sanity. And it costs you sanity because you are able to successfully touch something. And what you are able to touch is, I would imagine, Miss Bellinger keeps a purse of some sort. You could look for something in there. Yeah. You don't see any metallic sharp objects out at the ready. Well, so if, if he's going to go through a purse, at least she's not going to know it's him, right? So at least that's what he thinks. There could be two things of interest in there. So his first item of interest was something metallic. Um, so I don't know if there would be some sort of hat pin or metal comb or something. So that, that might do the job. And the other thing he might be interested in is if there's a compact with a little mirror so if uh, if this thing can't be cut by metal, maybe you can somehow reflect it as light, because he's not entirely sure of the nature of these things. I would say most certainly you would find a compact. I managed to roll uh, zero one on my, my divination. Hmm, indeed. All right, so you reach into her handbag and you feel the cool metallic outer shell of a compact. And you're able to pull it back through the breach. For your part, Maggie you likely don't notice the small sort of jiggle in your purse because you're doing something else. What is Miss Bellinger doing during this time on the train of personal reflection or mad ravings? Maggie hasn't quite unpacked all of the pieces because last time we had to make a very fast getaway and it, it was close having to throw everything. She's obviously inspected everything just to make sure that it's okay but she has the steamer trunk nearby. She has taken out the first piece that, that they found, the arm, which I believe was the arm, and has that laid across her lap as she sits and pens a letter. And then the head, the last piece that we found, is on the table next to her so that she can write with one hand while she kind of lovingly caresses these two pieces with the other hand. Very good. Uh, you pull back the mirror, Professor. And it is now with you in this strange space. And you're going to attempt to reflect the threads in some way. Walk me through that. What's that look like? Kind of interfere with them. So if there's a thread from her wrist going back to the simulacrum, then he will... So as I say, he's got two two strands here. So um, one of them is the, the comb, the second one's the mirror. So with the comb, he'd try and sort of rip the thread away having pulled the comb into this kind of other reality um, but if that doesn't work then he'd take the, the compact mirror and uh, put it in basically where the thread is not not cut it would be as if the thread would be a beam of light so he'd try and sort of put the the mirror yeah I get what you're trying to do okay um, so as this is an otherworldly place really pow is always going to be your active stat and so this action will cost you MP and will require a power roll. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Fortunately, Richard has good power. Oh, ho, ho. zero four. Hmm, fantastic. Uh, you begin to refract some of these threads. And as you do, Maggie, f for you, you, you feel, I guess, a strange like, itching along your spine. And it begins to sort of force your body to contort in these really strange ways because it's a place you can't itch and it's a little unnerving but I'm going to offer you a power roll of your own and see what um, 
what potential moments of clarity you could have. I'm going to offer you a hand of fate to remove the disadvantage that you currently have for a single roll. All righty. Okay, 68 under 75. You get a moment of clarity from the baleful influence. The clarity will last an indeterminable amount of time. You feel, and I stress that word specifically, you feel as if Richard has his hand on your shoulder and you get a deeply reassuring sense that somehow, some way, things are going to be okay. And in that sort of moment of clarity from this raging fever and edge of madness where you're at, you stare out the window just a moment to see the passing landscape rushing past the Orient Express. The landscape, of course, is dark. The light of the train spills out uh, all over the several carriages with windows. You lights it up just for a moment, just momentarily enough. And as you stare out into those windows, two eyes stare back at you. Deep red eyes. And now you make me a power roll. Uh, 86 over 75 because these like to roll eights as well. I will say that as Maggie's like penning this letter uh, and contemplating her friends and their intentions, Richard is the only one that Maggie really knows that she can trust anyways that he'll be on her side in this endeavor because they've gone so far together already with like exploring the simulacrum and the devices that he, there's no way he of everyone would betray her. And so she feels this hand and then she sees the Compton. It's like her two worlds coming together. And it's just so fulfilling for her in this, in this instant moment where she fails her power roll. In your ears, you hear it's hot inside. Why not open up the window and let some air inside? Let me inside. Oh, uh, of of course I can do that. You open up the window uh, just slightly enough and you get this gust of air that comes in and you can hear the landscape churning by and it opens up just enough and a very familiar form steps into your cabin. That of the Compton. And you feel absolutely powerless under his gaze. He has not broken eye contact with you. He reaches over and shuts the window and then leans ever so forward to take your face in his hand. And he says... The end has come, Marguerite. Now, now it's it's time now. It is time, but first, we must deal with your friends. Oh, yes. When we were eating the other day, I I got this feeling about them. They wouldn't say things around me. They are fearful of your power. As am I. Hmm. Luckily. I am not. Sit down here. He eases you back. A very firm hand sort of is placed on your collarbone and just gently pushes you back down to the the seat. It doubles also as the bed when it's pulled out. Stay here. I will deal with them. Of course. I, I will. I will await your return. He steps towards the door. Richard, in horror, you see someone join her in this space your hand recoils from this space where it was holding the mirror as a cold blast of air enters her cabin that humanoid form which is nothing but blackness and the ripples of the dreamlands here enters her space Uh, does richard recognize this form i'm guessing he does you have seen the form you have seen what this person looks like in that gap you've seen the absence of the threads he is very much going to try and take the comb and somehow stab him in the eyes with it okay so I'm going to say that's a hard power roll because you're trying to use a weapon through the dreamlands against a physical target 
So Richard is really fed up. I mean, this this guy, whenever he's making some progress, he, he just floats on by a window and and comes and woos her over. And he's he was he was that close to managing to somehow separate her from this uh, this simulacrum and and in he walks. So Richard is is really quite pissed off at the minute. Good. So he's really, really pissed off. Can he push that pay roll? <laughs> you absolutely can push that power roll. I will, as your keeper, remind you that failed push rolls are bad. He's going to really, really put his all into this. Every last ounce of hate that's been welling up, every last frustration, Richard is going to let rip with a tiny little metal comb. The tens has got a 90 on it, and the other one has got an 8. There it is. Hmm, 98. Well, failed push rolls are bad, and that's what I said that they were bad. Um, So, Professor, for your attempt to wield through reality itself a weapon against a creature and done so poorly, uh, I'm going to charge you twice as much MP as used. So I will be rolling 2d6 versus your current available MP. Anything, of course, that goes over your current MP goes into hit point damage, you're aware. Yep. Right. Uh, So that's eight points of MP that I'll charge you for that. Okay, that's fine. That could have been a lot worse. It could have been, and it will be, because I'm also going to charge you a D3 points of sanity for attempting to break reality. That's two points of sanity I'll charge you, and that means that you've lost five just before the end of the night. Nothing statistically happens there, but we'll just be mindful of that indefinite insanity as it's around the corner. Okay. Miss Bellinger, your comp becomes something insubstantial. He evaporates into fog in front of you and then exits through the tiniest crack in the door. A loving sigh comes out of Maggie's mouth. Mm. The train turns along. Afternoon and evening turn to night. And so by the time the party is finished with writing letters and preparing itself, it is half ten, roughly speaking. The weight of today and fleeing Sophia is going to weigh heavily on each one of you. But before we get too far ahead, I want to give Professor Courtney the opportunity to react to what he's just done and seen. What are you doing, Professor? Ah, that's a good question. I don't know if Richard's going to be shocked and horrified or further angered. Can Richard still see this thing? No, after after you swing on it and get such a, a violent mental backlash from attempting it, by the time your vision clears, the figure's no longer in her compartment anymore. Richard knows that the the Comte is uh, surrounded or, or kind of is the essence of an absence of threads. So he's going to sort of look around. And, ah, there we go. So much the same as a fly in a spider's web might sort of distort the web. Um, Richard's going to look around uh, the general area at the threads to see if you can see where the compt might be. Unfortunately, no. Uh, the, the threads here don't seem to line up. The, the darkness that was already here seems to have gotten darker. And unfortunately... It doesn't seem to be attached to any one singular location. Your head is splitting, obviously, from the previous uses. What he's going to do is he's going to start to look in the, uh, look for a Lady Elizabeth's carriage and then decide that this didn't work the last time, so he's going to take the device off and uh, do it physically. Okay. Well, the theory being, if Lady Elizabeth can, uh, can protect Maggie from whatever this is and, and get her out of this, then uh, of all the people that he might want to... Uh, to warn it's probably her first you slowly ease the device off feeling the pressure release momentarily from your head when you lift the device down you can see that there are some blood spots here along the lenses but that isn't the main concern it's the figure standing in front of you Richard hadn't thought that that was gonna happen hello professor get out of here Why? leave us alone you get punched all right. So you are able to dodge or fight back if you'd like. But you are summarily getting hit. Mm. He's going to fight back because fight back is better than dodge. Unusually for Richard, he's going to swing with his fist. 
I don't think he's ever done this before. That was good. Hmm? Good. That was a 14 under 35, so, sorry, 34, so hard success. So I have a success on you. So he has a greater success. Uh, and so he's going to end up raking you, and not like a bunch of leaves. So that's six points of damage. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you get clobbered uh, and raked down the front of your suit, and you feel both your body and your head impact the back of the, the uh, carriage wall. Now, what I'll ask is, Simon, you are likely in that either in front of or behind the professor normally. So uh, I'm happy to give you a standard 50-50 roll on whether or not you uh, hear this noise or not. Does that sound fair to you? That's fair. So you do hear a thump from the wall of the professor's bedroom. Uh, Simon is going to knock on the wall and go, y'all right in there? Uh, you are free to answer if you'd like, professor. Simon, uh, it, it, it's in here. Is Jim's cabin on the next side? Yes. I will run over and knock on it and say, yell, somebody's in the professor's apartment and zip out into the hallway with my pistol because that's all I have at the ready. I'm not going to take the time to limber up the Thompson or anything. Okay. Um, so you are alerted, Mr. Fraser. I'm going to go ahead and give Professor Courtney an action and then the two of you will be able to react and we can get into normal rounds. Richard is going to fish out of his pocket and I'm going to say it's probably in his jacket pocket because he keeps things that he doesn't know what they are with him. He's a bit crazy like that, likes to pick them out and use them uh, you know, and, uh, and sort of contemplate what they are. So he's going to pull out the vial of green stuff from Lausanne and he's going to toss it all over the Comte. Okay. So I feel like that's probably a dex roll rather than a fighting brawl roll. Unless you're trying to, like, shatter it on him? No, just throw the contents sort of over him. Yeah, and I think for him, it's probably going to be a dodge roll. Normally I would give him a fight back roll, but it's more like him just trying to get out of the way. Well, I guess he's got the option of maybe fighting back and definitely getting covered in it, but some sort of anti-vampire serum, maybe. Probably not, but... So Richard, Richard uncorks it and goes to throw it and probably lets go while he's sort of moving his hands in a backwards direction. That was a 63 over 50. Yeah, it shatters on the wall behind you. As it shatters on the wall behind you, the wood and the beautiful paneling of the Orient Express begin to, begin to sort of bubble and uh, corrode. Looks like it might have been a, a powerful acid. Fenelink doesn't move. He doesn't have to dodge, obviously, because it's an unsuccessful attack. He stands there, and you get a sort of haughty smirk. Why, why won't you leave her alone? What, what is it about her? I like her. Well, so do I, and I wish you would um, avert your gaze, your attention, somewhere else. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, so, Mr. Fraser, you've been uh, alerted, and uh, I guess... Are you, are you joining in from with Simon's uh, concern? Well, I mean, it certainly sounds like uh, he's concerned. Something's happening to Richard. And I think it's time for me to grab the Lupara and uh, a couple of shells uh, out of the box and load it as I exit my cabin and make my way with all speed to Richard's. Okay. So, Simon, if you're continuing forward to the professor's cabin, you're going to get there first. And then I would just rule then that, um, Fraser, you'll be there the next round because you'll be grabbing a weapon and roll and uh, loading it. Is the door locked? I think that's purely up to the professor. I'm afraid I think the door would be locked. So Simon tries the handle and it would be locked. So next thing he's going to do is try and kick the door in. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and make a strength roll to kick the door down or in. Uh, 49 under 80. Yeah. I mean, the locks, locking mechanisms on the Orient Express doors are ornate. They are not heavily secured. And so with a swift boot kick, you crash through the door and see the professor um, sort of just barely on his feet. There's a strong, heavy smell of something acidic in the room. And then just opposite him, no more than two feet, is 
a man dressed in rather strange French period garb with a long overcoat and his sort of freakishly long fingernails are coated in a red blood. I'm trying to remember if Simon saw the Comte in Venice. No, I I believe that um, that would have been Mr. Fraser who saw him on top of the building. You you actually didn't make that role. I think, though, it's reasonable to say that you could put two and two together given the dress and um, random person. This is not a, a random Turkish gentleman in a fez. This is something, someone totally different. And, and the, the professor is bleeding because he was slashed, correct? He does appear to be bleeding, yes. It, although it's hard to see because his back is somewhat towards you. Oh, okay. Uh, then, um, who are you and what are you doing in the professor's cabin? I'm going to shoot. You're going to shoot? He looks at you, strangely concerned. Do it, my good man. Shoot. And on his action, because you kicked down the door for your action, he's going to make an opposed power roll with you. And he's going to encourage you to shoot. That is a six. Well, I passed with a 49 under 65, but I doubt that I beat his roll. Yeah, you do not. And so you fall under a sort of strange mental framework. You get that same sort of passionate, encouraging desire to shoot. It's just that you don't have that same desire to shoot him. You're going to shoot the other person in the room because that's what this man wants. Well, at least everybody on the car should have heard me. Yep. Yep. So you're going to make a firearms roll. And in a very, very rare occurrence, I'm going to allow you, Richard, to make a dodge roll because this very specific type of firearm attack, because it is being done so slowly, can be dodged as written. That's good. So Simon turns very slowly, almost robotically, and you can tell, Professor, that he's suddenly aiming the gun at you. And that's what gives you the dodge roll. Excellent. Richard, as I said earlier, doesn't have a very good dodge roll, so... uh... Uh, they've done it again, so it's the same as the roll earlier, not the previous one, but it's a it's a it's a delta green fail. It's a sixty six again. Well, it's also a seventy three miss on Simon's part. Okay, Simon, I'm going to play a hand of fate for you, and I'm going to force you to re roll that. I'm sorry, Professor. That's a fourteen under twenty. All right, very good. All right, so roll damage, please. That's six more points of damage to the Professor. Very good, Professor. What are your hit points? Uh, lower than they were a minute ago. We, we have six left. Splendid. A gun goes off. Everyone hears that. Uh, the window in that carriage is shattered as the bullet passes through you, Professor. And it feels like getting punched with a sledgehammer. Because I assume, if memory serves correctly, that pistol is, what, 45 caliber? Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, so there's a loud report and the the glass shatters, the wind picks up. Yeah, so go ahead, Professor, it's your action. Is Richard able to get out of the door? Um, I would think so. I mean, if you've ever seen the doors to cabins on the Orient Express, they're not very wide, but it would be possible for him to get out, uh, provided he made a dexterity roll to get around Simon. Yeah. That was a 70. (laughs) Over 50. You try to get around Simon to get out of the door. You are unable to. This will put Simon with an advantage die next round because you're literally on top of him. Yep. It doesn't mean you won't get to dodge because under the rules of hypnotization in this matter, he just does move very sort of slow, so you get a chance. So I'll re-rack the initiative at the top of the round and then ask Miss Bellinger, are you doing anything after the gunshot or are you sort of blissfully still riding your Aunt Edith while the melee and the carnage begins. I think that the the Comte is going to take care of whatever is necessary to take care of. I I trust him. He told me to wait here for him to come back and uh, I am going to obey that order. So on 70 in a nearby room 
Paul exits the cabin and into the hallway. Also, because he'll be coming out into the hallway shortly thereafter, this is something that Mr. Fraser would see. Lady Elizabeth, if you're going to engage on 64, you can. I leave it up to you. I don't think I would. You don't think you would? Okay. No, not with hearing gunshots going off. Understood. Totally your choice. I can leave you out of the fifth. That's fine. So now, Mr. Fraser, on 60, please. Yes, uh, Fraser is hustling to Rich's compartment quick as he can. If the door isn't already wide open, he will push it open and take a very brief moment to take in what he sees in the room. Yeah, okay, so getting out into the hallway itself and getting um, facing the, that area where the commotion is, you can see Simon bodily in the doorway. You're not able to actually get into the room because there's now two people trying to pass through this doorway. Coming down towards you is Paul. And in Paul's hand, he has something very long and wooden and sharp. Do I see that the Comte is in there? You don't. You're not able to, to, to visually make him out yet because he's not there. I think um, uh, I'm just going to say, wait, 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 wait a moment, Paul. We don't know who it is. Let me through! Simon, let me through! And I'm going to try and push my way through. I'm going to try and physically force my way through. So I think that's going to be opposed strengths because right now Simon is hypnotized. So the two of you oppose strength, please. Okay. I think Simon's probably quite a lot stronger than me. But I just failed my strength roll. That's a 19 under 80. It just misses extreme. So you feel someone push you from behind, Simon, and you don't like that at all. And so you sort of with one free hand push back against that not not to do damage by any means but just to to say hey buddy get off me sort of that's that's the the momentary thought that goes in richard you use that to sort of continue to squirm out of the room and that's for you simon when you feel that imposing impending order that continues to ring in your ears that this is man that's trying to squirm around you is the one you're supposed to shoot well, I do feel Simon's, even though, quote unquote, he would be point blank range, he's got the professor literally pushing past him on the side, busting his arms, and he's got Fraser behind him. So I don't think I would get the point blank die because I've got people all over me. They're not moving me, but I don't think I can actually aim the gun that well. Yeah, I'm willing to accept your argument to not make your firearms roll better. You will still be making a dodge roll, likely, Professor. It is a seven. All right, so, uh, Professor, if you'd make a dodge roll. And what are the chances of rolling another in 66? So, in madness, I bring to you, Fraser, uh, a picture that is indescribable. The Professor pushes past Simon and for a moment barrels towards you before trying to make a quick left down the hallway. As he does so, slowly, somewhat inexorably, Simon turns and with his pistol aim, shoots the professor in the back. Now you can roll damage, Simon. It's five points. Another gunshot goes off. Professor, you hit the deck as you're bowled over by this gunshot. Does the fact that the professor has tried to squirm through and I've had this kind of pushing and shoving with Simon mean that I now can ha have some sort of view of the Comte in the room. Yeah, absolutely. So the Comte will go now. Fraser, you see the Comte in the room there, not but just feet from you. And then you see something rather mystical happen. His body becomes flexible in ways that you were not prepared. It shifts, it changes in front of your eyes. It becomes something more putty than anything else. And he drops into this, for just the, the slightest moment, drops into this strange amorphous blob shape. And when it springs back up, a full-sized tiger launches itself at you with this monstrous roar. Would you care for me to roll sanity? I would absolutely want you to roll sanity, yes. I think that's only right and proper. Oh, 
Well, goodness gracious me, um, that is a successful sanity roll. 22 under 42. Very good. You will lose only one point of sanity in this regard. All right, then. And so now he is going to make a bite roll against you. Uh, I'm going to try and dodge that, if I may. You may. All right, I do have a successful roll. I'll just put it that way. That is not a successful dodge, and I have not nearly enough luck to make it one. Um, that is a hard success for me, not a extreme, which is very good for you. Oh, good. You get bit for eight points of damage right in the shoulder. And the tiger is tall enough to sort of stand on its hind legs and keep its mouth clamped on your shoulder. Blood sprays all over the inside of the compartment. I am struggling and um, let out a scream of pain. Ah! That is definitely a scream that you hear, Lady Elizabeth. Um, But that said, it's the end of the comp's action. I hear that when I'm able to, I'm going to drop what I was doing and run as best as I can with healing gut wounds. Okay. You head out into the corridor. As soon as you reach the corridor itself, the middle of the train, you see Professor Courtney sort of flailing on the ground. He's been shot in the back. You can tell just from this angle that the barrel of Simon's pistol is smoking. And he seems to be sort of slowly raising the pistol again to fire at the professor. Can I try and knock into him and knock his gun away? Like, not try to grab it from him, but just bump into him to push the gun away so he's not aiming at the professor anymore. Yeah. I don't know mechanically what that would what that would be, but just in sort of instinctive <laughs> bumping into him. So what I'll say is I'll give you a hard dex roll uh, to get in the way and or somehow shield Simon from being able to get a, uh, a clear shot, which would put him at disadvantage. Zero six. Ooh, okay, so I will then for you, Simon, uh, apply a disadvantage roll to your next pistol shot. Before I start at the top of the round, I want to give Richard an action on 50. He's at the end of the round. He deserves at least some uh, attemptive action here on his part. You're at one hit point, Professor. The Orient Express is barreling towards Constantinople, and it looks like the days of wine and roses are just about over. I don't think this would be a terrible time for uh, one last spin with the device. If it's no good to him now, when will it be good? Have at it. What would you do with the device? I think he's going to go for the black lens and the the new one. Okay. Sort of fumble forward on the ground, still trying to crawl away from your killer, and you're fumbling with Professor Smith's device, trying to line up the lenses. He's got a plan. I'm keen to hear it. So he's going to pop it on, and, and if I remember, the black should show us... I'm sure you've described it more eloquently, but I, I'm going to say a load of dead spirits. Yeah. So Richard is going to do his very best to try and... Again, so we've got the, the new lens in now. Try and sort of rouse a load of dead people to try and, I don't know, dissuade the comp or get rid of him somehow. Yeah, I only might not be able to persuade them at all. They're dead. I mean, what do they care? But uh, he's going to give it a go. Very, very interesting idea. Um, So you place the device against your face and then are going to force yourself to make a power roll in an attempt to access the power that they're in. Yep. That's 42. Successful power roll. Now you have to pass the MP challenge. How many magic points do you have left, Professor? That's the question. It, It might be three. I've rolled a two. So you have one MP and one HP left. You feel the device fully enact and you see your vision come back. Um, You called on the black lens and the other powers within there to see spirits in a desperate attempt to somehow save yourself and others. Uh, All along the corridor here, you see those same silhouettes appear again in the darkness. Their rotting flesh, the pieces that are left of their spirits from once they came have are walking the aisle. Some watch this charade in 
pure ecstasy. Others are deeply concerned. There are those in the corners of some spaces crying. And at the far, far end of the corridor, from a door that leads to the saloon car, a shadowy blue shape walks out of the side of the car. And a deep dog growl echoes down towards you. How would you beseech these spirits that are there? What would you call to them to do? What 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 is your deepest need in this hour? I think Richard would um, summon his strength and say, um, "In in there, the one, the one who isn't, the one who is more dead than dead. He, if you find peace, if you can send him away." So. Again, as this is the Dreamlander active attribute, is going to be your POW. I'm going to require a hard POW roll for you to bolster your forces here in an attempt to stave off the comp. That was a good choice. 13. So that is definitely a hard success under your POW. The energy of the device begins to whir into motion. It's something really you've never experienced before in this fashion. The circles that sit around those lenses begin to spin. And so even for those of you in the physical realm, like you, Lady Elizabeth, you would see and hear this strange apparatus continue to click. It has never continued after it has been set. But there's almost a strange whirring that's going on now. And the professor is looking down the corridor. And you see the the crystalline rays of his eyes pure and clear like never before and it reflects what's going on in the dreamlands you can see the figures he's he's beseeching this of course will require a sanity roll from you as this is completely unnatural and i failed that with a 69 over 65 nice okay so i'm gonna take a a d6 sanity from you Um, Only three points, so there's a thing. And I'm going to give you a little something extra. Because you're so keenly aware, because the image of that space in the Dreamlands is so dim and dark and and accented just by these strange spirits, you're going to make out just the strangest small blue shape at the end of that reflection. It matches the powder color in the hotel room. And that's your action at the end of the round, Professor. And so now we'll get on to the top of the round. And given all of the dexterities in this space, I'm going to have you go first, Simon. Well, you said Simon actually had a penalty dice because he was successfully blocked by Lady E. So he rolled an 85. So right next to you, Lady Elizabeth, uh, a gun goes off is of course a little uncomfortable but it goes awry Uh, screams now can be heard aboard the train many of them Uh, and so we'll dip from 80 to the next 80 Fraser for you this creature all it's going to do is hold on to you so I've not had a chance to do anything since it bit me I'm keenly aware of that it does not do damage to you in the HP sense Okay, but it's just got me. It does, it does. And what it's going to attempt to do is drain points of your, temporarily drain points of your strength. You'll get a strength roll to oppose it. And um, it's going to roll its strength in an attempt to continue to lap up and suck the blood out of your body. No, 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 that is not a successful strength roll. Okay, well, you are going to then temporarily lose... 15 points of strength. Kind of slump a bit and um, try and regain my uh, composure and my my posture and brace myself. I'm definitely staggering a little. Lady Elizabeth, are you going to continue to make uh, Simon's life living hell? No. I think if I hear Fraser crying out, I'm going to go to him. Okay. Probably a very stupid thing of me to do. But 
Fraser would hear Lady Elizabeth yelling James because that's where her brain immediately goes. Yeah, once you turn your attention towards that portion of the train car here, you can see that there's a massive tiger that seems to be trying to eat Mr. Fraser and it has chomped down on his shoulder. And you can almost see the hate in this tiger's eyes. It's not biting um, successively down on him. It's clamped down and it seems to be trying to inhale like its nose flares big and it's it makes a a sucking sound it's really really disconcerting so you do hear lady elizabeth calling out your name fraser i want to try and pull him away if that's possible like just grab onto him if that's not possible in this case i can do something else yeah, you, you can absolutely grab onto him if you want to pull him back. I, It would end up being an opposed strength roll, which you're more than willing to, to make. I'm happy to make that with you if that's what you'd like. Yes. Okay. It's like the one person in the world she really cares about who is on this train, so she's going to try. Zero one. Don't tell me he also got a zero one. No, nope, not saying that at all. Um, He rolled really, really well. He rolled an extreme success, but he didn't he didn't roll a zero one. Um, so you are absolutely able to tear Mr. Fraser away from this tiger. It will, of course, cost him a little bit of HP for you to do so, um, but only two points. You come off the bite and when you do the entirety of what the tiger had gathered in its mouth comes loose and that is mostly blood. And so blood pours down the front of you and into the the cabin car. And in front of you now, Lady Elizabeth, is a massive tiger. Not today, you don't. Pulling Mr. Fraser away. You just hear just sort of muttering to herself, talking to the tiger, but also saying, don't you go, James, don't you do this to me. Speaking of that, uh, Mr. Fraser, why don't you go ahead and give us your action? Stand back, your ladyship. And I am going to level the Lupara at this tiger and pull the trigger. And I would imagine I'm not more than a couple of feet away from it. Oh, I wouldn't imagine either. So because the Lupara is a short muzzle shotgun, I get the uh, point blank bonus that I wouldn't get if it was a full length muzzle. I am going to roll some dice and see if this does anything at all to this thing. Well, thank goodness for the bonus die, because that would have been a failure otherwise, but that is a successful. 54 under my uh, rifle shotgun of 72. Okay, go ahead and roll damage. Um, And at this range, this thing does 4d6 damage. Mm -hmm. 19 points of damage. Okay. You blast this tiger back and into, into the professor's room. It flattens against the far wall of the carriage where the windows are wide, been blasted wide open. And it lays back against the carriage. So, Professor, um, you have a problem on 50. The space around you is being rushed by these dark spirits. And they rush into the room you get the feeling that they are eager to fight back against whatever it is this thing was. As you do so, you can see the space in the corridor has been cleared. And in that space, there is something hurtling towards you. It is a beast of strange dimensions and proportions. It's your action, Professor. What are you up to? What does the beast look like? Oh, looks are really uh, strange. It looks like a a massive wolfhound. Although the way it's shaped is mathematically incorrect. I think that's the best way to state it. You get the intense feeling that it's coming directly for you. Nice. I think Richard will probably run down the corridor. Well, or crawl down the corridor. Away from the comp room. Past Maggie's door. Assuming it's next one down or or similar and just try and turn a corner at the end so it can't at least rush him okay you hustle down the corridor until it eventually makes a small right and left before the the next 
train car. You'll be able to break line of sight with the creature. Yep, that's cool. That's what he's after. Okay. It's either that or go back in the room, but he's probably going to get shot and stuff, so that's nah, probably not a good, good move. Mm, probably not. So that'll be the end of that. And that will be 80 at the top of the round for you, Mr. Griffith. You know, your quarry seems to have left. Am I still hypnotized with the tiger getting slammed? I'll say you're not. I'll say it, it breaks. All right. Uh, Simon is going to be shaking his head loose and trying to assess the situation. So he's going to forego his action this round while he takes everything out. Good. And he's also um, kind of distraught that he really can't. Does he remember what he did under the hypnotism? Or is it like a blank? Yeah, you wouldn't remember what you did. It's a total blank. Um, although you would feel that your pistol is warm. Yeah, he's he's distraught that he has lost the last few minutes. He can tell that there's a gap from what's going on with his gun and where he is. You take the round to gather yourself. That will be the Compton 80. So seeing the tiger land against the far wall, um, it rests for just but a moment and then becomes mist and floats out the window. What has um, what's Paul been doing this this whole time? Because I know he ran up the corridor with a with a stake. Because he's just been staying out of a, out of the chaos. He was trying to get into the room when all of the other people were trying to get in. Uh, so now that he's got an action on seventy, he would step into the room and then immediately come to your aid. Are you all right? Oh my goodness! No, 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 I'm not. Get get up! Get get him up! That thing did something to me. I. I can, I can hardly stand up. I, I feel like I've, I feel like I've run up the side of a mountain. He looks you dead in the eyes, Fraser, and says, "You've been bit." I, I know I've been bit. He pulls your jacket off, like the the shoulder end of your jacket, off to get to where the wound is, and you see him. He resecures the stake that was in his hand, and he takes out a vial of water and he pours water over your body. Does that have any effect on me? Uh, it does. It it has the same sort of physical effect as peroxide would have. But for you, it actually heals you three hit points. <sighs> um, and you see Paul press his hand against the, the bite wound. And he says, uh, St. Michael may save us this evening. What the hell does that mean? Is that what I think it is? It's, it's the Compt. He's here. He's here for everything. And that includes us. What you put on me, uh, is, that, is that holy water? Of course. Fraser smiles. <sighs> the Lord is indeed good. Going to help Fraser up to his feet as best as possible, help Paul. Yeah, they're, they're trying to get him resettled. Simon is beginning to come out of it. Uh, the professor is nowhere to be found at this point. And realistically, that is the best time for us to end. And so... We want to thank you for joining us on this portion of our journey to Constantinople. In Act 5 of our Horror on the Orient Express campaign, I look very much forward to next week. <laughs>